nice sunset breeze and I got the cold one up. This is how I like to eat up miles when offshore sailing. Unfortunately, there is also times when there is absolutely no wind and even worse. But the margins are uh, starting to shrimp. Uh, I hope the cyclone is not starting to uh, move faster because then this can be challenging. The most critical thing in offshore sailing is your engine. And of course the range you have in terms of nautical miles to run. I'm also gonna share a few strong arguments for why your offshore range should be at least 500 nautical miles as a minimum and why I prefer to have 1000 nautical miles as part of my safety thinking. Join me as I'm sailing around the world on B3, a Bavaria 55 cruiser. In this video I'm gonna share my opinion how I look at fully electric sailboats and hybrid solution. And I have used my own boat as a basis and done some research for it. I'm also gonna share the reality of energy harvesting from my solar panels and why what works in Europe does not work in the Caribbean and this is not even close to work in the South Pacific. This is important to take into your equation if dreaming about going electric as the truth might surprise you. And uh, I don't expect you to agree with me. I'm really happy for uh, seeing comments and that you disagree. And um, that's totally okay, because this is my point of view and my opinions and how I look at this. And I've done a lot of research and I actually did some research seven years ago and honestly it's not much changed. It's um, a lot happened with batteries, uh, of course lithium have become better and also electric engines has become better. Uh, but I'm gonna share more uh, in this video. When I was in Europe, I invested what I believed back then a good amount of money in solar, controllers and batteries. I had really good help from amazing people giving me qualified help and advices. The only problem that I have experienced is that their expertise unfortunately was limited to their European standards and experience, which later turned out to not be valid for my onward journey. I have been honest about this in earlier episodes. I did not do this to save the planet. It was in a selfish perspective trying to save money in the long run and to extend my off-grid capacity. I believe it's fair to say I failed. And even though I have continuously tried to improve and expand off-grid time without using my generator, I've still not succeeded. This is something very few dare to admit and tell you. But geolocation is a big part of my experience. And the reality is that you can't cherry pick the numbers and success stories because the nature and the real world will punch you hard in your face. In the introduction I said you need a minimum range by engine that's 500 nautical miles. Even though on B3 I have 1000 nautical miles as a minimum for safety reasons. I'll come back to the reason for this, but first let's take a dive into what those numbers mean in a fully electric or hybrid solution. Here I have visualized the amount of ocean volt batteries needed for a theoretical range of 528 nautical miles. This is based on their suggested engine, which I even believe is too small. It's not only the solution that's to be questioned, but even the amount of money only for those batteries needed. For the battery investment alone, I could instead burn diesel equal to 28 times around the world non-stop with my diesel engine at 7 knots, only to put things into perspective. So if only one round is the goal, I even believe the footprint is smaller burning diesel if you take the entire ecosystem from creating to recycling of batteries and solar panels alone. 
729.6 kW is what's needed to move B3 528 nautical miles on a single charging. So if I wanted to charge this with solar only, I would need more than my existing three panels. In fact, I would need a lot more. And even if I made a rig and placed 50 of my 52 volt panels on my boat that on a very good day gives 2.5 kilowatt each, it would still on a good day only give 125 kilowatt. Meaning in reality with the extreme optimistic calculation, I would need 291 solar panels on B3 only to charge this up in one day. So let's scale this down to the recommended solution on the configuration tool that OceanVault has online and even triple my solar capacity of today. With 9 panels that on a good day brings in 2.5 kW of energy, I could harvest and store approximately 22 kW. However, in the real world, in average, this would optimistically take between 5 and 10 days to charge up the 90 kW battery bank. For a theoretical range, that's 66 nautical miles. And let's say I'm unlucky to have 3 knots of ocean currents against me, as I had outside of Fatu Iva. My range is now reduced to 50% with this solution, meaning the range is only 30 nautical miles. Quite interesting situation would surface here, because I would see my destination disappear while drifting backwards, waiting for sunshine or wind for the next two weeks or months. The real world is not always ideal and not as pink as the influencers try to show you. It's not always following seas and warm meal waiting. It can be emergency situations forcing you to use your engine. Having the limitations I just pointed out is a safety problem. This is not a joke, it's a fantasy project. I would say it's better ways to not only save the planet, but your finance as well. Yes, I could be lucky having sunshine while running my electric engine, stretching the range a bit. But remember, when I need my engine the most is not when the sun is shining. And that could be after 10 days like this. So that's why hybrid solution is such a good alternative, because a full electric is definitely not realistic, right? At least not for offshore sailing. Let's look into this as well, because I have done some research and trust me, I do have experience with generators and especially the Fisher Panda many of the hybrid solutions are recommending. So I have a Fisher Panda generator on board and it's the machine that <laughs> about well, anything on board that I have had the most problem with. I mean, I struggle to find words uh, for how much I actually hate that machine. And uh, if I can give a friendly piece of advice, don't ever even think about buying a Fisher Panda. So believe me when I'm saying I have and still are trying to not be dependent on a generator. But the reality versus dreams and imaginations are not always compatible. This is an honest and strong message to anyone even thinking about a hybrid solution. The heart of your solution is what I try the most to get rid of. And this is what you will be depending on with a hybrid solution. I mean, it might be a good engine for uh, those that has a professional mechanic on board. But if I was Fisher Panda, I would stop selling it to uh, private persons and private yachts. Because that machine is not designed for be on a remote place on a sailboat for private people. It's so service demanding and also cost efficiency is like a joke, to be honest. And if a Fisher Panda runs more than 50 hours without any problems, it's like a miracle. Can you hear that? That's something exotic as the sound of a Fisher Panda actually running. <laughs> I have over the years unintended become a Fisher Panda expert. It's nothing I can't fix on this machine anymore, but it's annoying, expensive and time consuming. So yeah, I would say that's uh, one of the biggest things I have to point out if I would even consider a hybrid solution. 
but most generators are service demanding. They are not as cost efficient as they claim to be and also very unreliable. So let's dig into this popular solution that's gonna revolutionate the sailing world called hybrid solution. I believe a hybrid solution can solve your dream about electric engine, but in my opinion it's an imaginary green solution. If I take basis in the previous downsize electric solution that revealed 5 to 10 days of charging for a ridiculous short range of 66 nautical miles, it should be pretty obvious I would need energy from somewhere else. Energy on demand, meaning a generator. Not only for charging, but even for continuously motoring. So after some rainy days I would need to run my generator at full throttle for 7 hours only to get the 66 miles range at 6 knots. And to extend my range I would need to be running a 15 kilowatt generator at full throttle with max load for every hour I want to extend my range at only 6 knots speed. This means in the real world that difference in diesel consumption compared to running my Yanmar is minimal. Except I will get there 33 hours earlier at economy speed. I have nothing against Oceanvolt. In fact, I believe they are among the best out there. The reason I use their figures and prices is because I see them as the most serious and honest companies in this jungle of solutions. But their solution does not come cheap. 112,329 euros for an imaginary green solution that will not burn much less diesel than a modern economic diesel engine. And when you need a generator the most, I can assure you it will not start. That's why I have a backup. And this Honda generator, it costs 2,500 euros and that's less than a few services on my uh, main generator and this one always starts. However, the flaw with this one is it consumes a lot of petrol and compared to the Fisher Panda, it's not that cost efficient in consumption. So to have a Honda petrol generator to power your hybrid solution is a very bad idea. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a joke, um, especially if you compare it to a modern diesel engine. Before I jump to my safety concerns about the full electric or hybrid solutions, I'm gonna share my summary with you. Because how I see it, the only difference between a hybrid and a conventional solution besides a fancy name it's significant more expensive and a reliable solution versus extremely vulnerable and unreliable solution. This is unfortunately the reality. Only the maintenance interval, that's the reality on my generator, translates to full engine service for every 300 nautical miles by engine. So for a long distance sailor, this is a joke. If I was planning on a hybrid solution today, I would do anything to avoid a generator. Instead, I would consider a nanny diesel engine without turbo and motherboards, and combine this with a Balmar alternator. However, end of the day, my $1000 question is why? I would still burn diesel and from a selfish point of view, initial cost is so high, I would not save any money in a 10 year perspective. Here is something no one tells you, and this is my experience supported with data from my Victron system. What works in the Mediterranean during high season is far from enough in the Caribbean. The reason is as obvious as it's to be overseen. The Caribbean is sunny for sure, but not as good as the Med during high season. Also the days are shorter, giving you less hours of sunshine for your solar panels. And what works in the Caribbean, you would need to double for having the same effect in Panama. This is not only during the rainy season, but because it's located in the convagation zone. 
And this might come as a surprise even to many sailors. The difference between the tropical paradises in the Pacific and Panama in terms of weather is basically nothing. Meaning if your solution is sufficient for rainy season in Panama, you will do just fine in the South Pacific. The entire chain of islands from Panama to Indonesia all sits in the convergation zone, meaning 210 rainy days a year. So my previous calculations for a fully electric is not even close to work here. <laughs> I still have uh, approximately 100 nautical miles to go. Hey, Cyclone Mal, I know you're in a hurry and really don't care about me, but could you please consider to put on pause for let's say 10 days so I can charge my fully electric boat? And please, if there is a god, give me sunshine, a lot of sunshine, because my batteries are flat and I have almost twice my 66 nautical miles range to go. And it's gonna be a lot of rain later today. So it's nice to make rain now. And um, I don't know what I would have done if I had an electric engine because uh, 200 nautical miles is quite a distance with no wind. This, my friends, are serious things and a fully electric is already disqualified from a safety point of view. And the last thing I would like to be dependent on right now is the most unreliable machine you can buy for money, a diesel generator. Also, I would have to pray to God that the engine hours since last full service on Gunda still had at least 15 to 20 hours left. Otherwise, it's almost guaranteed she will stop working. Her feelings, or sensors if you like, would not care much about my situation either. This is a serious safety problem, and it can easily get from bad to worse, as thunderstorms and lightning are quite normal in the front systems. Most sailors know that taking a hit from lightning is bad. In fact, even being close to it can sometimes be enough to give you serious problems. What lots of sailors don't know is that a direct hit on your rig is bad. In fact, it's seriously bad. The strength is compromised, meaning it's your engine that will bring you safe to shore, to replacement and re-rigging. That's why your range by engine might be something to look at. Being more than 500 nautical miles from shore on the passage is not that extraordinary. After all, we sail on a planet where oceans are dominating the surface. In my opinion, there is two major problems with an electric engine. No matter where your fuel source come from, if it's regenerated from solar or from diesel. It's the power resource when you really need it. And it's the consequences after a lightning strike. I unfortunately have first-hand experience with this, and it was not even a direct hit. And what's the heart in a hybrid solution was the first that died for me. I found out that uh, most likely the motherboard on my generator is fried, uh, because at the moment uh, when this lightning strike hit the water, I had my generator running. My generator stopped, but my Yanmar diesel engine was not giving up. And one of the reasons I always run my diesel engine in thunderstorms is if it's first started, it does not stop by a lightning strike. My engine is important if taking a direct hit. Not only for assisting me to shore after rigging is compromised, it also doubles as a powerful bilge pump. It do happens that a boat also takes in water after a direct hit. This is only a few reasons why I mean neither electric or hybrid deserves a class A certification. It's also some of the reasons I would never go offshore sailing with solutions like this for safety. And the illusion of a green boat with hybrid is in my eyes just an expensive illusion. And remember, I'm already sitting in a 22,000 kilo petroleum product. If a green image was important to me, I'd rather buy a bucket of green paint. This will do the exact same job for a fraction of the cost. However, I don't like green boats. I think B3 is beautiful just the way she is. I have not touched the regenerate electric solution, because as a standalone solution without the generator, it's basically useless for anything outside coastal sailing. 
Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope I did not step too many people on the toes here. Remember, this is my opinions and how I look at it. And I'm not telling you that this is the blueprint. It's how I see it. And uh, hopefully a lot of you would appreciate my honest approach to this topic. So see you back here next week. Thank you so much for watching and all your support. A special thanks to all my patrons that makes it possible for me to upload these videos. Much love from me on Be Free.